Hello, good day, and welcome to Prague Chattery 777. Well, we've been talking about Jethro Tull, and we've made it all the way to the late 80s, 1987 to be precise. And we're going to be talking about Crest of a Knave. Uh, this is kind of the comeback album, uh, in a way. It had been um, three years since the release of the last Tull album, uh, Under Wraps, which I think is a very, very good album. Uh, but... Uh, you know, that whole period in the early 80s, you know, with albums like A, uh, Broadsword and the Beast, Walk Into Light, and Under Wraps, uh, really alienated Tull from its, uh, you know, core fan base. Um, so I think, um, by the time they came to this album in 87, there was a considerable amount of pressure to, um, you know, get back in touch with those fans and, uh, create something that they would recognize as, you know, distinctively Jethro Tull. But, um, you know, also that proved that they're, you know, they were current and they were, uh, you know, hip for their time. Um, and yeah, I, th I think they did a really good job of it. I, th I, I mentioned in the Broadsword video, I think Broadsword and the Beast is another album that is kind of looking to the past as a reference to try and um, create something that the fans are going to like. And, <clears throat> you know, I guess, I guess Broadsword and this are kind of similar in that regard, because they're both tr consciously trying to, you know... Um, bring back that classic tall sound. I think this one's the more successful of the two in terms of um, updating the tall sound as well as um, you know making it sound familiar. Uh, this came after, like I said, it's, it's a bit of a long break. There's three years be between Under Wraps and this. Um, and a lot of that had to do with um, Ian Anderson's voice. Unfortunately, the Under Wraps tour, uh, you know, even though he sang brilliantly on that album, um, singing that material night after night proved to strain his voice quite a bit, and uh, I think he was ordered to take some time off um, to recuperate his voice, and unfortunately his voice is never quite the same, but, you know, he, uh, he puts through a, a pretty good vocal performance on this, you know, his voice is obviously much more toned down, it's not the same... Um, you know, crazy roller coaster kind of style that we'd heard before, but um, <clears throat> the mellow Anderson still sounds quite good. And I think his voice is one of the reasons that uh, this album tends to get compared with Dire Straits. He sounds a little bit like Mark Knopfler. Uh, and a lot of the guitar playing, uh, Martin Barr's guitar playing on this, that real clean, um, you know, kind of arpeggiated style sounds a bit like that too. Uh, but that's, you know, minor, minor criticism. I still think on the whole it's a really good album. Um, also, during the break, Anderson, I haven't mentioned yet, but he was he was heavy into his salmon farming enterprise, which uh, I think he'd been doing since around the around the time of the folk trilogy. I mean, he, you know, the salmon farming thing wasn't a new thing at this point, but uh, that's just kind of a fun little aside. That's what he was doing in the 80s. Um, so yeah, um, the big the big thing about this album, of course, is uh, the. You know, music music aside, not talking about the music, the, I think it was the Grammy Awards where uh, this album beat Metallica. They beat This album beat And Justice For All for the best hard rock metal performance, which just goes to show you how silly the Grammys are and how silly those award shows are. I mean, it should not have been in the same category. I mean, this, this you know, I, the, it, this album has its heavy moments, but I mean, it's not the, hel the heaviest tell record I've ever heard, you know, it's got nothing on Minstrel in the Gallery as far as, you know, riffs and stuff go. Um, so I, I think it's quite funny that it, that it beat Metallica. It really shouldn't have, you know, it, it shouldn't have beaten And Justice For All. I like this album more than that, but, you know, I'm biased. I still like Metallica. I'm not knocking Metallica. Um, of that whole fiasco, the Grammy fiasco, the best, you know, Ian Anderson got the last laugh and he said, well, you know, after all, the flute is a heavy metal instrument. <laughs> Oh, Ian, what a funny guy. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, on the whole, I think this is, this is a pretty solid effort. Uh, and it's a return to the organic sound, obviously. Um, you know, the, the synthesizer stuff, particularly Under Wraps and Walk Into Light, was very heavily electronic. And, and for the most part, this album is returned to that organic, you know, band playing sound, which is, which is good. Um, so, yeah, without any further ado... Let's talk about the lineup. <laughs> um, the lineup was kind of a mess at this point, really. I mean, the Toledot hadn't really had a stable band since the late 70s, since the, the folk trilogy. Um, 
And I think the actual band, this, yeah, the band is credited to just being Ian Anderson, Martin Barr, and David Pegg. So David Pegg on bass, Martin Barr on guitar, Ian Anderson on acoustic guitar, flute, and vocals. Um, and then for drummers, the, uh, we have the debut of Don Perry, who become a very long-standing drummer. Very good drummer, American drummer. Um, not quite as busy as Barry Barlow, but uh, he's got a really, really good, uh, he's got some serious chops, Don Perry. He contributed some great drum performances on some of the later Tall albums. Uh, we also have the return of Jerry Conway, who had been, who'd played on the Broadsword album. He plays on a couple of tracks on here. And uh, there are a couple of songs that, on this that still have the drum machine, so it's not necessarily, you know, obviously it's the comeback album, but it's not necessarily the exact return to form. There still is that influence from the Under Raps era and some of that synthy stuff. Um, so let's talk about the tracks. Let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, track one is Steel Monkey. The album opens with Steel Monkey. Uh, and it opens with the drum machine song. So, uh, you know, and, and even though it is still the drum machine on here, and we still have that, that kind of heavy synthy... Even though it still has that synthy vibe in the electronic drums, it sounds removed from um, under wraps. I'm not sure what it is. You know, I, I, I almost want to say, is it the guitar? That big... And, like, the kind of solo lines, but... I can't say that either because there's a lot of guitar on Under Wraps as well, so I'm not sure what it is that that makes Steel Monkey separate from the material on Under Wraps. Probably it could be his voice because again he's singing, you know, he's writing songs that are more suited to his vocal capabilities now. Um, so maybe that's it. But it's a it's a it's a good song. It's about uh, it's about constructing the construction workers on a building. You know those guys walking around on uh, on the beams as they as they put up a building in Manhattan, for example. That's what a Steel Monkey is. Um, and there's some there's some good good lyrics in there witty lyrics about the working man. Uh, track two is Farm on the Freeway. Now, this this is this is a contender for best song on the album. This one uh, really evokes some of that classic Tull vibe, um, but it's also current for 1987. I really love the it's got a, a real slow atmospheric intro. Um, it's talking about the agricultural theme, which is kind of a quintessential Tull thing. Um, Talking about development and how uh, you know this this guy's this farm is now a freeway. Hmm, that's sad. Um, but yeah, I, I really I love the, I love the slow build to it. It's got a real strong uh, couple of first verses, and uh, it breaks into a great middle section where we get a lot of wonderful Martin Bar guitar work. I love that riff. And uh, it goes into quite a quite a tricky bit of playing. There's a really nice nicely arranged uh, middle section there with lots of uh, lots of tight playing by the whole band. Um, and of course, great flute solo. Um, it all winds its way back to that uh, that kind of quieter quieter bit of the beginning. So yeah, Farm on the Freeway is definitely a, definitely a, a you know late '80s tall classic. I I really like Farm on the Freeway. Uh, that leads us to track three, uh, Jump Start. Um, this is kind of the, you know, the, the generic rocker of the album, I guess. Um, probably, probably my least favorite on the album. I should say, sorry, regarding Farm on the Freeway, that's the first time we ever hear Dome Perry on the drums. Um, should have mentioned that then. Jumpstart, the third song, we've got Jerry Conway on the drums. Um, who, like I said, a little bit simpler, but that's okay. You know, you don't, drums don't have to be busy and crazy. Um... And yeah, yeah, Jumpstart, Jumpstart's pretty good. You know, it's got it's got some of those. Uh, you know, there's moments of it that remind you of the early folky kind of stuff. But uh, for the most part, it is kind of uh, you know, you know, it's the late '80s kind of rock song. You know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but track four, I think, is a great highlight. Said she was a dancer. Um, I really, really like this song. This is this is kind of uh, the ballad of the album. It's quite mellow, uh, quite subdued. Um, uh, you know, again, you know, the, the, a lot of Tull's songs have dealt with sexuality in one way or another, so I mean, it shows that even, even in their aging years, and I mean, this is nothing, this is about halfway through the career, he had a lot more aging to go, <laughs> um, but he was still able to, you know, to, to write, uh, lyrics that dealt with that topic very well. And I love, I love the little musical hook in the chorus, uh. It comes in, uh, you know, hey, Miss Moscow, what's your story? That's the wrong part. Uh, it, it's, it's in the chorus, though. It comes just a couple of times. You get that little... It's just this, like, little musical, 
you know, mini melody that pops up between some of the vocals, but it sounds really, really good. I mean, this album on the whole is, is, is very well arranged. There's lots of really nice little, little embellishments on it. Uh, I mean, I think the production on it is really good. It's got a really crisp, clean, clear production, um, which, again, might lead to the comparisons with uh, Dire Straits. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, Said She Was a Dancer is really, really good. And uh, the, the lyrics at the end, it discusses that, uh, you know, that they, they, they share a kiss, they know it's wrong, and then he trottles himself off to bed. <laughs> I, like, I, I like the sudden ending factor, too, you know. So I took myself off to bed. And a song. I love that. That, that kind of that takes me back to Minstrel in the Gallery kind of era stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's a, a highlight for the first side. And then we flip the record over. Uh, and I'm sure if you some of you have noticed there there obviously there was a CD re version of this album that came with three extra tracks. Um, I don't live in reality, so I'm doing the vinyl version, which has got less tracks. So. Um, Sorry about that if you wanted to hear about uh, Dogs in Midwinter and uh, some, some of those other songs. Uh, maybe another time. Maybe another time. Anyway, we're talking about the vinyl release, so we are flip the side over. We're going to talk about side two, which opens with Budapest. Um, again, like Farm on the Freeway, this is contender for best song on the album. Uh, this is the return of the extended epic. This is the longest song they've done in quite some time. It was ten minutes long. But it's very, it's removed from some of the other epics they've done because it is actually very tranquil. It's a very calm, sweet, quiet piece. Uh, it has some of that quintessential tall rhythm, you know, da da da, dun da, da. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's it's a love song again. It, it's dealing with um, the topic of uh, I think a waitress. I think a pretty waitress who's very shy and sweet, and it's talking about her. Um, but it's it's very you know it, it's it's melancholy. There's a sadness to it. There there's a, there's a lot of sadness in Budapest, and maybe maybe it's talking about life on the road and all these fleeting moments that you have to leave behind because you're constantly on the go. You're constantly moving to the next town. I'm not sure. Um, but it is it is a very very well put together. You know you, you can tell that uh, you know Anderson and the band really put their hearts hearts and souls into making that track really really good because it is fantastic. Uh, I really like the middle section too. We kind of get that boom, da da down, 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 down. We kind of get that. Uh, oh, I don't know. <sighs> sleazy? I don't know. I wouldn't call it sleazy. It's just it, it, this nice little breakaway that kind of changes the tone of the piece for a little bit. It's still very atmospheric. It's just that keyboard tone is really really nice. Uh, so yeah, Budapest is is fantastic. Uh, then the second song of side two is Mountain Men. Um, this song, this song, I, the, I, I've kind of got a bit of problem, a bit of a problem with because, for all intents and purposes, this could have been one of the best on the album. I really, really like the first half of it. I love that intro. Um, there's, there's a, an absolutely classic tall melody in there. And that that intro is just so tall, and then it it eventually just kind of winds up as this, um, you know, just kind of generic late 80s rocker. Um, and that, I mean, that melody is still kind of present there, but the intro is just so much stronger than the song itself. And I think the, of all the songs that uh, are compared to Dire Straits, I think Mountain Men is probably, probably the most guilty. Um, but it's, you know, it, you know, like I said, that, that melody is so, so good. And, you know, the only reason that I've got a problem with the song is that the, f the first little bit of it just gets you so ready for this quintessential stuff. And then it just kind of, you know, it just kind of winds up as this just kind of, you know, rock song. Which, you know, it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world, but, uh, you know, I, I think they could have exploited that melody a little bit better. There's a great melody in there. Um, but anyway... Uh, this takes us to the last song of the vinyl edition of the album. Sorry again, I'm not doing the other songs, I'm just doing the vinyl. Like I said, I don't live in reality. Uh, and the last song of the vinyl is Raising Steam, another train song! So we've done, we've had Locomotive Breath, we've had uh, Journeyman, we've had Trains, Watching Me, Watching You, and now we've got Raising Steam. Um, you know, the, again, the, this I, I, I could go ahead and say, oh yeah, another generic 80s rock song, but I really like this song. I, I, I uh... I, I like the the melody in the verse. Dun 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 dun
Um, yeah, I, I really like Raising Steam. Uh, it's also the other song on the album that's got uh, a drum program on it, so it's got the electronic drums. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's it's removed from the stuff on Under Wraps or Walk Into Light. You know, it's it still sounds more organic, more like a band playing. Um, and you know, Raising Steam is a pretty simple song, but I think you know the 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 melody and all, and all the all the it's all the right ingredients in it to make it an appropriate wrap up for the album. Um, then you know there's a great great image great imagery of an old steam locomotive churning through the churning through the countryside. Uh, quite cool. And then of course the big cars. I may not be coming back. Um, and yeah, the, with raising steam, I mean, and steel monkey, I mean, there there still is a heavy em emphasis on those synthesizers. We still get that kind of we still get that kind of stuff on raising steam. But again, it's a little bit more subdued than some of the stuff that we'd heard before. Uh, so there you go. I hope I didn't talk too too long. About it. Ah, that is Crest of a Knave by Jethro Tull. Great album cover, by the way. I really like this album cover. The uh, very royal-looking thing with the flute and the and the hawk, and then flip side we get a cat. Ian Anderson is a big fan of cats, so it's appropriate we've got a cat there. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's uh, it's you know a solid comeback album. You know, there hadn't been Tull for a while. Um, you know, obviously Anderson had to you know kind of figure out a new way to use his voice, and I, I, you know, I think all in all, this is a very successful record. I think it, it I think it achieves exactly what it was set out to do, and that is re, you know, get get in touch with Tell's fan base, and uh, you know, they got some great publicity out of it. And, you know, there there is there is some some good songs on there. Uh, I, I think I like Under Wraps a little bit more. I still I still like that I still like that 80s period. You know, this is the start of the hard rock period, right? Um, according to Wikipedia, they call it the hard rock era. Uh, and, you know, if, if anything, that's the period that I have problems with. I have more problems with the hard rock era of the late 80s, early 90s. i got more problems with that than I do with the synthesizer period. But maybe I'm just crazy. I have no idea. I really don't know. Uh, but that's enough about that. We're going to talk about the next, uh, the next Tall album after this, which was released in 1989, and it's called Rock Island. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you around, eh?